and I'm, my eyes are not on her at all, are they? They're on the bottom of the swimming pool. And, and that jump is made so much harder because I'm looking at the bottom of the pool. If I had my eyes on, you know, the father coaxing me into the jump, right? But I didn't look, I didn't look at her. I looked at the bottom of the pool. I think our faith can be a lot like that. We uh, can be successful in, in, in this life as Christians. We can grow. We can become more mature in our faith um, if we look in the right place. I think we make things a lot harder when we, when, when I, look at the bottom of the pool. We, we keep our eyes locked on the deep end. This morning, we are going to look at the call, the call of Moses. Um, when God extended to Moses his invitation into, into his work. And we're going to look at that invitation under a couple of different names. And then we're going to see how Moses responded to God's invitation, thirdly, and how he, how Moses, like myself, had his eyes glued on the deep end. Okay, the guys in the back are going to pass out some Bibles for you. I'm going to read from Exodus 3, the burning bush story. Well, I'm just going to get started. I'm going to try to get started. What's that? Yeah, we, we can figure this out. Okay. Now, Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. Oh, here we go. Let me go back one. I think we can go back a slide. Yeah, there we are. So, he's keeping the, fo- he's keeping the flock of Jethro, priest of Midian. He led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a mist of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, and yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see... God called to him out of the bush. Moses, Moses, he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near. We're having trouble, aren't we, guys? We can be patient, though. We can figure this out. Can you go back one? Okay. Um, Do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said... I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their suffering. And I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of, up out of that land to a good and broad land a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hivites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt." Okay, so, you are Moses. You're Moses. And God has just extended to you his invitation. One more. God has just extended to you his invitation to bring the people out of Egypt. What do you do next? What is your, what's your next move? You know what this makes me think of? Uh, it makes me think of a, of a trailer for a movie that's coming out next weekend. Um, I have to admit, I'm a, I'm a big Marvel movie fan. Um, and does anyone know which movie is coming out next weekend? I do. It's, uh, it's Thor, the next, the next the big Thor series. So Thor is a hero in the Marvel Universe, and in this movie... Um, Thor Rangarok, he is, he's captured. He's captured by the enemy, and he's forced to fight as a gladiator in a coliseum, right? And um, 
he's, he's placed there in the center of the Colosseum, and there's this, this black door, this gate on the other side of the Colosseum, and you know that just some horrendous monster is going to come barging out of that, that, that gate. He's, he's going to get destroyed by this giant monster, and everyone in the, the stands, they can't wait for that to happen. They're just, oh, this guy's going to get smashed, yeah. And then it happens, this giant green monster comes flailing out of the other side, and everyone's looking at Thor, this poor little gladiator. They're like, oh, he's, he's got to be terrified. He's shaking in his boots right now. And if you've seen the trailer, what happens next? Thor's looking at this giant green monster, and then he says, yes, yes, all right. And then, then the audience, just, they just get silent because they, they, they want him to go down hard. But, but he's super excited about this because he explains, it's a friend from work. <laughs> that giant green monster, that's the Incredible Hulk. It's his, his buddy, right? Now, that Thor, in his reaction, that could have been, and maybe should have been, Moses' reaction to this invitation, right? Moses should have said, God, this is incredible. This is incredible. You are going to take on Pharaoh? You are going to rescue your covenant people? You know, I, I, I tried to do that once. I tried the whole deliverance thing. Didn't go over super well. But now you're going to step in. You're going to act. You're going to bring them up out of Egypt. That's awesome. It's incredible. That response, that would have been entirely appropriate. Because what God was doing, he was extending to Moses an invitation into, if you could help me, into the incredible. God's extension of an invitation into the incredible. An invitation into the larger story. Look up, Moses. I am going to use you to confront human evil, to bring out my oppressed people, to rescue them, to establish them, to establish this people as the beachhead of my kingdom rule on earth. And from that beachhead, that people is going to extend justice and righteousness and a knowledge of God to all the globe. I have a plan, Moses, and you have a part in it. The fact that you, you, you have a plan, you know, I know that. Of course you have a plan, but you're going to use me? What? That's incredible. And you know, this whole idea, this is, this is what Psalm 8 is celebrating. The wonder of the dignity of man. Well, let's, let's look at Psalm 8. When I look at your heavens, it says, and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him? You know, I think we read those lines and we're like, oh, the stars, they're so beautiful. But it's not about the stars. This psalm is not about the heavens. It's about man. Look at the next couple lines. You have set man, human beings, you've set humans just a little lower than the heavenly beings, a little lower than the angels. You have crowned man with glory and honor. You've given man dominion over the works of your hands, all sheep and oxen, the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea. This, the panorama of stars above us is so vast and so beautiful, and yet you have set man over all creation? What is man that you would do such a thing, O oh Lord? And look at a couple things from this, the end of this uh, little set of verses. You've given him dominion, it says. You, you've made him a, a ruler. You've given him the responsibility of reigning. And, and look, look at the three um, classes that man is reigning over. Sheep and oxen, birds of the heavens, fish of the sea. The psalmist... Um, David, in this case, who wrote Psalm 8, he's taking this exactly from Genesis chapter 1. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion. If you could one more. There we are. Dominion. You see? Birds of the heavens. Livestock. You know what this is, you know what this is teaching us? What Psalm 8 and what Genesis 1 is teaching us? 
from page one of the Bible. God's intention, his purpose behind all creation is to make a planet, to make it good, Queens, kings and queens of creation, like Narnia, right? Set them over that planet, um, that good planet, and to ask them to guide it, to rule it, to shepherd it into further good. That is our purpose and plan, to make this world and one another flourish. God hasn't given up on that plan. That was the plan on page one. That's the plan today. And look at these next verses. This is the destiny, the future of man. Truly I say to you, this is Jesus speaking, in the new world, when the Son of Man, that's Jesus, when I sit on my glorious throne, you, the 12 disciples in this case, you will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. This is kingdom responsibility language. And now, Revelation 5 opens it up to all the rest of us, not just the 12 disciples. For you, Jesus, were slain, and by your blood you ransomed a people from every tribe, language, people, and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. That's an incredible promise. But you know what? I, I have to admit, the there's a problem with watching all these superhero movies. The problem is, once you finish watching The Avengers, or Spider-Man, or whatever the, the latest flick is, once you finish watching these movies, you, you, you can walk away saying, man, my life is so boring. <laughs> like, this is lame, I keep doing this and nothing happens. <laughs> but that is so, so not true. Our lives as Christians called into this should be anything but boring or mundane. You see these, these movies, <laughs> what do they do? They always have to try to get bigger and bigger, right? You know, in the first movie, they destroyed all of New York, and now we're going to have to destroy all the eastern seaboard, and next, okay, this is going to be a global thing. And They just have to keep on raising the stakes. And Tony Stark says, hey, Spidey, enjoy this new suit. What, what does our God do? The creator of the universe calls us to be his kingdom soldiers, he brings us into that bigger story, that incredible story, he says, you know what? I'm going to make you, I have made you, in my image. I'm going to ask you to do my work. I'm going to empower you with my spirit. And you know the work you're going to do? You're going to confront evil. After all these movies that we watch, it's all about good versus evil. That's your job too. You're going to confront evil. You're going to do it inside of yourself. There's evil there that you have to do some business with. You're going to do it out in this world. You're going to be the people that bring justice in this planet. It's really necessary, isn't it? And you know what? There, there's another plane in which you are called to do war, do battle. The spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places, in Ephesians 6, we fight on that plane too. You have been invited into the... You know what the psalmist says back in Psalm 8? What does he say in response to this amazing privilege to be God's image-bearing rulers of the world? What does the psalmist say? He says, what is man that you are mindful of him? That's his question. Moses' question is kind of similar, isn't it? It, it, it almost, sounds, almost sounds the same. Let's, let's look at it. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh. so that you can bring my people out of Egypt. But Moses said, he didn't say, what is man that you are mindful of him? He said, who am I? Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring up the children of Israel out of Egypt? What is this? Is, is, is this humility? Is Moses saying, who am I that you would bestow on me such an honor to do this work? Is that what's going on there? No, that's not what's happening. 
Moses is, he, he's afraid. <laughs> right, right, it didn't work. I have reason to be. I have every reason to, to doubt myself. But you know what? <laughs> I think it, it would help us to be a little bit more sympathetic with our, our man Moses if we realize the magnitude of just what God is asking him to do. I want you to go to Pharaoh, you know, the one who's the ruler of the known world, of, of the greatest superpower on the planet. I, I want you to, to go to that guy, the guy who raises up the pyramids, you know, the pyramids that we see in Egypt now. Those are around a thousand years before Moses. So, like, that Pharaoh guy, I, I want you to, to go to him and to say, you know what, you, you don't need your your slave labor force of two million people, just let them go. I know you're really into architectural projects and building things, but just get a different hobby. This is what, what, what God is asking Moses to do. It, it's an invitation into the incredible. It's an invitation into the, da, 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 um, into the illogical. It's an invitation into the incredible. It's an invitation into just simply the illogical. Have you paused to, to consider how often through Scripture God asks people, God invites people into the illogical? It's all the time. Let's look at a quick list here. Um, if we can go to the next slide. Huh? I think we can, just one more slide. What, what illogical thing did God ask of Adam and Eve? Right? We're going to slip through, go through these pretty quick. Don't eat from the tree. Why was the tree there in the first place? And if you're going to put a tree that has such disastrous con consequences if you eat from it, why are you going to put it in the middle of the garden? I mean, you can at least, like, tuck it away in a corner somewhere. Wouldn't that be smarter? No, that's not what happened. Next. Noah. Noah was asked to build an ark. You know, I'm not, I'm not sure if, if he'd ever seen rain before in his life. He'd probably never been on a boat. But God's like, okay, I know the movie, The Titanic, hasn't come out yet, but I'm, I want you to make one of those. And, um, yeah, it's going to take a while. So, you know, so some people think, this is interesting, the, the, in Genesis 5, um, we have uh, the first time that Moses is mentioned, it says that he's 500 years old. And then um, when Moses completes the ark, it says that he's 600 years old. We don't know if he was working for that entire duration, but he was working for a long time. Construction projects take a while in the ancient world, especially when there's no Home Depot down the road. So I want you, in front of all your, your friends and mostly enemies, I want you to be building this boat that no one has ever heard of, and you're probably um, hundreds, of mile from, hundreds of miles from the Mediterranean Sea. Um, but build a Titanic. Do this illogical thing for me, would you? Next, next example of someone, Abraham. Now this guy's, he's got the mother load of examples of illogical invitations. Leave your, your hometown. Leave, leave Ur, where you're probably a very wealthy, successful man. Um, <clears throat> produce an offspring, despite the fact that you're 75 years old. This is going to work, I promise you. And you know what? When you get that offspring, I, I, I want you to sacrifice him. Does any of that make sense by human standards? No. Joshua, what's he going to do? He's going to march around Jericho. This, this is God's battle plan. He's going to take, just take um, you know, yourself and your bros and, and, and walk around the city and then blow trumpets and do the same thing tomorrow and the day after that, the day after that. And you know what? On the last day, do it seven times and then like shout really loud. Look what it says. When you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat. Yeah. Seriously? <laughs> but what'd he do? He started marching. Naaman. Maybe you haven't heard of this guy. He's a Syrian commander. He was um, at war with, with the, uh, the Israelites. But Naaman, he had leprosy. He had a, a skin disease. And he went to the prophet Elisha, and Elisha told him to go wash in the Jordan River. Do it seven times, and um, you will be cured of your leprosy. Naaman um, says, this is ridiculous. Um, I'm from Damascus. There are way better rivers there. I don't need your stinking Jordan River. That's, that's exactly what he says in the text. Loose paraphrase. Um, but once he kind of got over himself, 
soaked himself, he washed in the Jordan, cured. Jonah, what's he going to do? He's going to go to Nineveh um, after he does the whole whale thing. Go preach in Nineveh. And, and you know what Nineveh is? It's the capital of Assyria. That is the, the next superpower in a, <laughs> the history of the Middle East there. And you thought that Egypt was bad. Nineveh and Assyria, that's like Egypt on steroids. Go to those guys and tell them to repent. It's going to work, I promise. Even the cows repent, if you read about it in Jonah's 4. The disciples, if we move to the New Testament, there's t- plenty of stories. I'm just going to give you one. These guys are fishermen, right? They're professionals. They know what they're doing. And they didn't catch anything all night. And Jesus shows up and he's like, all right, this is what you're going to do. You're going to take the net, you're going to put it on the other side. It's going to work, I promise you. And these guys are thinking, it's the same water on both sides. Like, uh. And they, I think they said they, they pulled up a fish. They were counting every single one. They realized this was a miracle. So clearly, clearly this is a pattern in Scripture, right? We've established that. This is the thing. What's going on here? Why? Why does God so frequently extend to us the invitation into the illogical, into the impossible, if you want? God is grooming future kings and queens. And what's the one thing that you need to be a king in his kingdom? That's faith. That's trust. God needs you to know that he is faithful to his word. God needs you to know that if he tells you to build a boat, it's going to rain. If he tells you to march around in a circle 13 times, I think, the walls are going to fall down. If he tells you to fish, there's going to be a whole lot of fish. You're going to be eating fish for weeks. You see, when, when, when you step out in faith, this is the principle. When, when you step out in faith, when you do something hard, you do something illogical, do something impossible that you know God is asking you to do, rain is going to fall. Walls are going to come crumbling down, and God is going to show up. And you're going to be stronger for it. So what about Moses? Was he, was he stronger for it? How was Moses' faith? Now, we've seen how he responded to God's invitation, right? Invitation into the incredible, into the impossible, into the illogical. Who am I, he says. Well, I think this, this exchange between God and Moses here, um, I think it's, it's programmatic of the rest of their conversation. It, it, it kind of goes like this the whole time, really. Um, what, what happens is, is Moses, he's so inclined to look inward, to, to just look at himself, to, to keep on asking, who am I, who am I, who am I? And God, on the other hand, God invites Moses to look upward. He promises to Moses, I will be with you. So I, I'm going to call this dynamic, I'm going to call it Moses' myopia. His, his nearsightedness. He can only see what's right in front of him. Now there are actually five objections that Moses raises to God's call, to God's invitation. This is the first one. I'm going to go through all five super quick. Next, um, so first, who am I? Then, who are you? What if the Israelites that I'm called to go to, what if they say, what is his name? Next. What about them? Those Israelites, they're not going to believe me. They're not going to believe that you appeared to me. This is, this is not going to work. Then he says, I, I, I can't. I, I, there's no way I can do this. I'm not eloquent. This tongue thing, it's never worked out really well. Um, I'm, I'm not going to be able to speak to Pharaoh. And then finally, he just, he just gives up. No more excuses. He says, I won't. Please send somebody else. Let's look at number four. I can't. I am not eloquent. Because I think this is, this is fueling all the other four objections to the call. But Moses said to the Lord, Oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent, either in the past or since you've spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and tongue. 
you know, it's hard for us to know just what Moses was referring to here. You know, maybe, maybe he, maybe it is a genuine speech impediment. Maybe he had a, he had a stutter um, that he struggled with. Maybe um, being so long out of Egypt, 40 years in Midian, maybe he forgot how to speak Egyptian. That, that's a possibility. Um, maybe he just spent too much time talking to sheep. He didn't think that uh, talking to fish was going to work out for him. But how did God respond to Moses' objection? He didn't correct Moses. He, he didn't build Moses up. Moses said, I'm not eloquent. God didn't say, yes, you are. <laughs> Although maybe he could have. You know, honestly, maybe God could have said that. Look at this. Stephen, in his sermon, he says, Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. Moses was mighty in his words and deeds. Hmm. If you read Psalm 90, Deuteronomy 32, or Exodus 15, you'll know that Moses is pretty eloquent. He wrote those amazing poems. Um, but God doesn't correct Moses. God doesn't build Moses up. What does he do? Oh, we'll get the next slide in a minute. Maybe it's the internet. I can read it. Um, <clears throat> o Lord, I am not eloquent. God says, who made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Therefore, go, I will be with your mouth and teach you what you are to speak. You, you, you don't think you can do it, Moses? You, you don't think you're, you're up to it? I know. I know all about you. I know your flaws. I know every one of your flaws. I know the flaws that you hold on to. I know the flaws that you've created in yourself. I know the flaws that I created in you. Think instead, think instead of Abraham. What did Abraham do? What did Abraham do when God extended to Abraham his invitation into the illogical? God brought him outside and said to Abraham, look toward the heaven and number the stars if you're able to number them. And then he said, your offspring be. And this next verse, verse 6, that is one of the most important verses in all of the Old Testament. Paul, in Romans and his other letters, on that verse, not that one, he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. What is this talking about? This is talking about the nature of what it means to be in a relationship with the sovereign king of the universe. How, how does that relationship happen? Um, he's, he's an invisible presence that's almighty, and I'm this little creature. How is this going to work? How, how are we going to get along? It's going to happen through belief and faith. That's how right standing before God occurs. What, what, what did Moses do? Moses, <laughs> that the only way that he was going to prevent himself from tripping was if he spent his entire life looking at his feet. I know I'm not going to trip because I got these two guys covered. And you know, maybe he wouldn't trip by his own definition of what it means to trip, but he's gonna have no idea where he's going. Moses looked at his feet. Abraham, he looked toward heaven. He looked at the stars. And that's where, that's where God calls us to look. You know, we're, we're stuck with Moses' weaknesses or our own weaknesses, whatever those are. How do we not get stuck with Moses' myopia, his nearsightedness? The series that we're in right now, this Exodus series, it's called Freed to Serve. It's the name of the series. It's based off of several in instances in which God calls Moses to tell Pharaoh, let my people go that they may serve me. 
And you know what, I think this, this, this phrase, this title, freed to serve, I think it can operate on a couple different levels. You know, on, on, on one level, God is giving birth to a nation, right? The, 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 this is a historical occurrence. God is giving birth to a nation, a nation which he intends to be a kingdom of priests, um, priests which will faithfully reflect his image to all the nations around them there, there in the Middle East. But on another level, freed to serve, I think it points us to our freedom that we have as servants of Christ. We are freed from doubt, freed from fear, freed from this incessant voice um, which urges us to self-evaluate constantly. Moses asked, who am I? Keeping the focus on himself. God said, bro, that is so the wrong question. It's not about you. It's not about you and who you are. I am. Once you realize that, once that becomes bedrock in your life, it's it's not about you, it's about him, then you can start accepting invitations. You can accept that invitation into the incredible into that kingdom responsibility that God has called you to, both, both in this life and into the, in the life to come. You can accept that invitation into the, into the illogical, the impossible, that which just doesn't, doesn't make sense right now. Knowing that God is trustworthy and that he will always come through. If he tells you to build a boat, it's going to rain. You know, I feel a little bit guilty. We've been bashing on Moses for quite a while, haven't we? Do you remember how Moses' life ended? He, he, he was prevented from going into the promised land. That's, that's kind of sad, but let's look at his last request, Moses' last request. Moses says, I pleaded with the Lord at that time, saying, Oh, Lord God, you have only begun to show your servant your greatness and your mighty hand. For what God is there in heaven or on earth who could do such works and mighty acts as yours? Please, let me go over and see the good land beyond the Jordan. I want to see your goodness. I want to see your greatness. I want to see your might. I want to see the works of your hands. I want to see you. Where's Moses looking? He's looking at the stars. I want to see the works of your hands. And he wasn't wasn't able to go into the promised land, but God gave him a glimpse of it. He invited him up to Mount Nebo. And from Mount Nebo, God showed him the fulfillment of all of his promises. This is where it's going to happen. This is where I'm going to make my name known. You know, it it took a little while, but Moses accepted God's invitation. Now let's do the same. Let's pray. Lord, what is man that you are mindful of him? the son of man, that you care for him, but you do. You've called him up. You've called him into a great, great work. We don't deserve your attention. We do deserve 